So far in the first half of this documentary, we've offered four general evidences or proofs of our position that America is indeed the last day's entity referred to as Babylon in Revelation chapter 18 and its parallel passage in Jeremiah 50 to 51. We now want to show the connection between America and Rome, which we believe is clearly depicted in Revelation 17 as the mother of harlots or religious Babylon. The traditional view held by most Christians for the last 400 years and beyond has been that Rome, as manifested in the Roman Catholic Church, is Mystery Babylon the Great of both Revelation 17 and 18. However, the fact that the last day's Babylon is shown in Jeremiah 50 to be the posterity of the nations, or the last of the nations to come up, and is also shown in Revelation 18 to be a merchant nation, rules out Rome from being identified exclusively as Babylon, although there certainly is a direct connection and an inseparable link between modern-day America and Rome. While New England was settled by Protestant pilgrims seeking a sanctuary for religious freedom, it's important to note that the European conquest of North America was initiated over a century before that by the Spaniards, who claimed this continent for the true king of Spain the Pope of Rome, long before Jamestown was settled by Anglicans in Virginia or the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. And while there certainly were many influential Protestants who helped lead America to its separation from Britain, we will show in this message that the America that was born in 1789 was far more the creation of the Vatican and its Jesuit infiltrators than it was of Protestant Christians. And now, over 200 years after its creation, America is now fulfilling its intended destiny, as depicted on the back of every U.S. $1 bill, to work in concert with Rome as her proxy to build and usher in the devil's new world order, the global government of the Antichrist, as also seen in Revelation chapter 13. For that great gift of hope, Holy Father, we thank you and welcome you with joy and gratitude to the United States of America. To begin explaining the connection between America and Rome, we want to look at another important scripture at Revelation chapter 16, verse 19, which says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This verse says that great city Babylon was divided into three parts. We also see in Revelation 13 that the empire of the Antichrist will have three aspects, political, commercial, and religious. We suggest that the reason Revelation 16 verse 19 says the great city Babylon was divided into three parts is because the new world order of the Antichrist will be dominated from three cities, as by the way it already is dominated. First, from the evidence we're presenting of Rome's involvement in the building, planning, and continuing control over Washington, D.C., we believe that city, Washington, D.C., can be identified as political Babylon, which we do believe will be the city through which the Antichrist will come to power. We remind you that as shown in multiple Bible passages, including Revelation 13 and the latter half of Daniel chapter 11, the man of sin and son of perdition known as the Antichrist will be a man of war in control of a war machine that no other nation can defeat. Second, there is also a commercial Babylon, which we suggest is New York City, headquarters of the United Nations, just a few blocks from what is also the central power base of global commerce and trade, the New York Stock Exchange, and also the city identified by that colossal statue of a lady sitting upon the waters, one of the most famous of America's national symbols, what is called the Statue of Liberty, standing in New York Harbor, significantly on a star-shaped base with 11 points on the star, symbolic of the 10 kings that will give their power and authority to the 11th king in Revelation 17, verse 12, and also symbolic of Zechariah chapter 5, verse 11, which says that Babylonian woman called wickedness would be removed to another land and set upon her own base. This colossal statue is actually another image of the goddess Ishtar, Ashtoreth, the Libertas, with her seven-horned crown, a symbol of the seven seas upon which she sits as queen, a clear depiction of the goddess of that great whore that sitteth upon many waters of Revelation 17. 
New York City is commercial Babylon, the central headquarters of global commerce and trade, indeed and in fact the World Trade Center, through which the merchants of the earth have become wealthy, as John prophesied 2,000 years ago in Revelation 18 verse 3. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Revelation 16 verse 19 says that great city of Babylon is divided into three parts. America is the merchant nation of the world. It is commercial Babylon, with its commercial headquarters in New York City, where also the UN headquarters is located, and also where that huge idol of her mother, the whore of Babylon, stands in New York Harbor. But America is also a political Babylon, with its political headquarters in Washington, D.C., a city built with Rome's direction on Roman Catholic land with a blatantly occultic design to honor Rome and Rome's goddess, that same whore of Babylon, the virgin goddess Ishtar, also known as Columbia. And the city from which we believe the Antichrist, the first beast of Revelation 13, will rise to power. Again in the air, we fly over the mall now being actively developed into the sweep of beauty dreamed by its planners over a century and a quarter ago. On our way rears that shaft of glory to the glamorous memory of the first president. But as the old saying goes, all roads lead to Rome. Both of those cities, Washington DC and New York City, are to a very large extent controlled by and from the religious capital of Babylon. And that is without question Vatican City in Rome from which the false prophet, the second beast of Revelation 13, will arise. Back to Jeremiah 50 verse 12, an extremely significant verse in identifying the last day's Babylon. Jeremiah writes, Your mother shall be sore confounded. She that bare you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. As we pointed out, America is seen in this chapter as the daughter of Babylon. She is the uncontested last day's economic and military superpower that has built a global empire of both commercial and military power that no other nation comes close to matching. But she is also the daughter of her mother. And she still listens to her mother and takes orders from her, by the way. But one day she'll tell her mother to get off her back, as foretold in Revelation 17 verse 16 where it says, The beast shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. We believe Jeremiah 50 verse 12 refers to that same event, where it says, Your mother shall be sore confounded. She that bear you shall be ashamed. Rome is in fact the true mother that gave birth to America, as opposed to Great Britain. We do see America in Revelation 18, but in Revelation 17 we see a picture of America's mother the harlotrous mother church, headed by the Roman Catholic papacy. John writes in Revelation 17 verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. As the picture of an adulterous woman is used throughout the Bible to depict an apostate, idolatrous religious system. And as Rome has from the days of antiquity been known the world over as the city of seven hills, referenced by John in verse 9 of this chapter, where he writes, And here is a mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. We do believe that the woman in this chapter is without doubt the idolatrous Catholic Church, headquartered at Rome that parades itself as a Christian organization, in fact claiming to be the only true Christian church and dispensary of God's grace on earth. But that has for centuries promoted a counterfeit Christianity. That is not at all the true Christian faith established by the Lord Jesus and his apostles, but instead incorporates pagan practices, rituals, and beliefs adapted from ancient Babylon, including the idolatrous worship of and ritual prayers to the Babylonian virgin goddess Ashtoreth or Ishtar, Queen of Heaven, renamed Mary by the Catholic Church. John writes in verse 3, 
So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This false religious system is seen riding a beast, which we know from Revelation 13 and Daniel chapter 7, as a beast of global empire and governmental authority. From the time Roman Emperor Constantine commandeered the Roman Church in the 4th century, this false church has been hell-bent on global dominion over the kings of the earth, as John also writes in verse 18 of this chapter. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. From the days of Charlemagne in the 9th century, until the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, the popes certainly did reign over the kings of the earth. But the temporal power it appeared to have lost as a result of the Protestant Reformation, the papacy has now rebuilt through its proxy and its daughter, the American Empire of the 21st century, through which it is covertly regaining its reign over the peoples of the earth. In verse 4, John writes, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Purple and scarlet color. Scarlet color. Having a golden cup in her, her hand, hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. fornication. John gives us a vivid description of the Roman Catholic hierarchy that in apparent intentional fulfillment of this verse decks its bishops and cardinals in purple and scarlet colors that has through the centuries amassed to itself untold riches including control over the major central banks at the center of international commerce and trade. John writes in verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The Roman Catholic Church has perpetuated the Babylonian mystery religion making repeated use of the term mystery in reference to all of its doctrines, rituals, and liturgy, from the Mysterium Fidei, or Mystery of the Faith, pronounced by the priest in its abominable practice of the Eucharist, the mystery of faith. to the 15 Mysteries of the Rosary, prayed to its goddess, Mary, the Queen of Heaven. John then writes in verse 6, And I saw the woman, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church is the entity and organization that has the blood of millions of true Christian martyrs on its hands and a well-documented and undeniable history of many centuries of the most barbarous and cruel forms of torture imaginable inflicted on those martyrs, having mercilessly butchered, burned, and buried many more million Christian martyrs than pagan Rome ever dreamed of doing. Again, as we read chapter 18 of Revelation, we see America, the daughter of Babylon, the merchant nation, the hindermost of the nations, the richest nation on earth. But in chapter 17 of Revelation, we see religious Babylon, the mother of harlots, headquartered at Vatican City in Rome. We see this harlot religious system, which is Rome, riding on the beast of a global military empire. And that empire is the revived Roman Babylonian Empire, what is now the American Empire that Rome helped finance and helped her daughter America to build. I want to thank His Holiness Pope Francis. There have been many who have identified America as Babylon of Revelation 18. But where others have gone wrong and missed the mark was in failing to show the connection between America and the Vatican in Rome. 
But America itself has not only come to be controlled by the Vatican through its military arm, the Jesuit order, but that in fact America was from its inception established for an instrument of global domination, and not so much by the Freemasons or the Illuminati, but by the unseen hand that controls those front organizations and uses them to suit its purposes, that being the superior general of the Jesuit order, headquartered at the Vatican in Rome. The Vatican's military arm, its global network of agents and henchmen and assassins known officially or ostensibly as the Society of Jesus, one of the worst misnomers of all time, and known more commonly as the Jesuit order, has for centuries been carrying out the Vatican's scheme to regain, through intrigue, subterfuge, and subversion, the mastery and total control over the kingdoms of this world that it lost as a result of the Protestant Reformation. The Jesuits engineered and were intimately involved in the events that led to the American War for Independence and the founding of a new republic that broke the power of the British Empire, the Vatican's number one enemy at that time, and that also guaranteed religious freedom, because that also gave the Jesuits the freedom to operate where they had been outwardly banished from the Protestant kingdoms of Europe. We hear much today in the alternative media about the New World Order and a conspiracy for world government from some well-known men who do get some good truth out and who talk about the Brotherhood of Darkness and the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, the Bilderbergs and the banking cartel. But where these men fall short is that they fail or refuse to identify the real culprits behind the conspiracy for global government, which is the Vatican and Rome, as run from behind the scenes by the superior general of the Jesuit order. Today's exposures of the New World Order talk about Adam Weishaupt as the founder of the Illuminati in 1776, but fail to mention that Weishaupt was Jesuit trained and a loyal Jesuit agent, and that the reason he founded the Bavarian branch of the Illuminati in 1776, soon after leaving Jesuit Ingolstadt University by the way, was because of the disbanding and the official disestablishment of the Jesuits in Europe by the Pope himself which itself was a smokescreen and a ruse, brilliantly engineered by the superior general in power at that time, Lorenzo Ricci, who we will see as one of the true founding fathers of America. Today's exposers of the New World Order talk about the Rothschilds and the banking cartel. <coughs> Murdering scum! But fail to point out that the Rothschilds are loyal servants to the superior general having since the 1700s held the office of the guardians of the Vatican treasury, and that it is the Vatican that pulls the strings of the international banking system, that has itself been put in place with the ultimate goal of total and complete global economic control via the mark of the beast of Revelation 13, which we see in that scripture will be administered by the false prophet, the second beast of Revelation 13, which is the Pope of Rome. To understand who is really pulling the strings behind the international banking system, who is pulling the strings of the Illuminati, and the Masonic Lodges, and the Knights of Malta, and the Bilderbergs, and the Skull and Bones, and who is pulling the strings of the puppets and marionettes dancing in the White House and in Congress, and who also pulls the strings of the CFR, and the NSA, and the CIA, and the FBI, and the IRS, then we have to look to Rome, and in particular, to who is pulling the strings at the Vatican. And that is now, as it has been for centuries, the superior general of the Jesuit order, otherwise known as the Black Pope, and called that because of his invisibility and remaining in the shadows behind the more visible Pope, who is therefore known as the White Pope, and who is now, for the first time ever, also a Jesuit, and who is therefore by his Jesuit oath, subservient to the superior general of the Jesuit order, the Black Pope. We'll detail in a moment how America's creation in 1789 was the result of many years of planning and manipulation by high-placed Jesuit infiltrators working on both sides of the Atlantic. From that time forward, the Vatican fully intended to build and maintain control over her. Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. was founded by the Jesuits for that very purpose in 1789, the same year the Republic itself was officially founded. 
The Vatican gradually gained complete mastery over American politics just after the Civil War in particular, after Jesuit agents successfully carried out the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Since that time, the Jesuit order has exerted almost total control over American and European politics, up to and including the creation of the Federal Reserve System. That banking cartel has engineered Great Depression of the 1930s and its resulting New Deal socialism, the fomentation of two world wars, the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and the events of 9-11-2001, and then the Patriot Act, and the National Defense Authorization Act, and the detention centers, and the nationwide facial recognition surveillance system, and the rest of the Nazi police state America is being turned into. To understand this scheme for global domination and the role of the Jesuits in the founding of America, we need to go back a few centuries to the time of the Protestant Reformation and before. In 1302, Pope Boniface VIII decreed, It is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. This doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church has not waned or changed. In fact, it was affirmed in the 1964 Vatican II Council's Constitution on the Church. And it was this doctrine that was the inspiration for the papacy to create the America that materialized in 1789. The Jesuits were established by a Spanish priest named Ignatius Loyola in 1538 to enforce this papal doctrine. As a counter-reformation militia of mercenaries, spies, and assassins who swore allegiance only to the Pope and to the Jesuit superior general, and whose sole purpose was to return the kingdoms of the earth to submission to Rome by using the military arts of war after those kingdoms broke away as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Loyola's business plan for the Jesuits, initially to be only a small order of 60 henchmen, was presented to Pope Paul III in 1539. Loyola explained how the society would operate as a sort of revamping of the Knights Templars with a superior general that would answer only to the Pope himself. Loyola said his knights would foment and heighten the animosities that arise among princes and great men, even to such a degree that they may appear to weaken each other. In other words, divide and conquer. Loyola also said, Putting aside all private judgment, we should always be ready to accept this principle. I will believe the white that I see is black, if the hierarchical church so defines it. Meaning, among other things, when papal doctrine contradicts the Bible, I will follow the Pope. Loyola's plan included what is called the extreme oath of induction to be administered to those desiring to ascend to the higher ranks of Jesuitism to the level of officer. The oath was taken before three other Jesuits, including the superior general, flanked by two monks holding two banners, one with the papal colors of yellow and white, and the other a black banner with a dagger and a red cross above a skull and crossbones, with a candidate kneeling on a red cross of the Knights of Malta. Before administering the extreme oath, the superior general recounts the candidate's prior schooling in the order as a spy and infiltrator, stating in part, My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your own brethren, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Calvinists to be a Calvinist, among other Protestants to be a Protestant, and obtaining their confidence to seek even to preach from their pulpits, and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature your holy religion and the Pope. You have been taught to plant insidiously the seeds of jealousy and hatred between communities, provinces, and states that were at peace, and to incite them to deeds of blood, involving them in war with each other, and to create revolutions and civil wars in countries that were independent and prosperous, only that the church might be the gainer in the end and the conditions fixed in the treaties for peace, and that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duty as a spy, to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source, to ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of Protestants and heretics of every class and character, as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures, and the judiciaries and councils of state, and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. So that is a vivid description of the soldier level operatives in the Jesuit order. After acknowledging his prior indoctrination, the officer candidate then takes the extreme oath, repeating after the superior general and stating in part, 
that His Holiness the Pope is Christ's Vice Regent and is the true and only head of the Catholic or Universal Church throughout the earth, and that He hath power to depose heretical kings, princes, states, commonwealths, and governments, all being illegal without His sacred confirmation, and that they may safely be destroyed. Therefore, to the utmost of my power, I shall and will defend this doctrine and His Holiness's right and custom against all usurpers of the heretical or Protestant authority whatever, especially the Lutheran Church of Germany, and the now pretended authority in churches of England and Scotland, and all adherents in regard that they may be usurped and heretical. I do further promise and declare that I will have no opinion or will of my own, or any mental reservation whatever, even as a corpse or cadaver, but will unhesitatingly obey each and every command that I may receive from my superiors in the militia of the Pope, that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the pointer or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus. So that, ladies and gentlemen, explains in a nutshell what the Jesuits are sworn on oath to do. To wipe out and exterminate all resistance to the church militant and restore the Pope as the Godfather, as sovereign Lord over the planet, in place of and instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Loyola concluded his presentation, the Pope reportedly cried out, This is the finger stroke of God. So on September 27, 1540, Pope Paul III sealed his approval of the order with the highest and most solemn form of papal decree, a papal bull, ordaining the Jesuit order entitled Regimini Militantes Ecclesiae, the supremacy of the church militant. The following April, 1541, Loyola was elected as the Jesuits' first superior general. By the time the Vatican's Council of Trent was convened in 1545, what began as a minimal society of 60 men had grown into the thousands. After the Council of Trent, the Jesuits set out to literally take over the world step by step. They invaded every facet of European life with fanatical zeal. Education, the sciences, music and the arts, the hearing of confessions, and foreign missions. They focused on Gnostic and secular principles of knowledge and established hundreds of colleges and universities with the long-range goal to control the future leaders of society. They particularly sought to gain control of the education of the children of political leaders and other influential people in the upper classes. Through their leniency in the confessional, they gained the affections of the wealthy and powerful. They infiltrated Protestant churches and were instructed to preach Calvinism in Lutheran churches, Lutheranism in Calvinist churches, or Anabaptism in both, to maintain their cover and to cause division and dissent in those churches. Much of the apostasy and false doctrine that prevails in Protestant churches today was spawned by these Jesuit infiltrators including the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine and the preterist view of eschatology, two directly opposing doctrinal systems which were both designed to defeat the popular view of the reformers, that the Pope fulfilled the prophecies of the Antichrist. The Jesuits are also behind the diabolical assault on the traditional text from which the King James Bible was translated via the propagation of the Roman Catholic Westcott and Hort Greek text, from which all modern Bible perversions such as the NIV, NASV and ESV are translated. The Pope soon found that the Jesuits were indispensable to the survival of the papacy and eventually surrendered the church into the Jesuits' hands, for which the papacy was rewarded with a resurgence in power. But the cost of this resurgence was great because the black Pope and his army became the power behind the papal throne. 
and they still hold that power today. The popes continued to extend greater power and privilege to the Jesuits. Pope Gregory VIII authorized their entrance into commerce and banking and control of the Vatican treasury, a power they maintain and wield to this day through the Rothschild banking houses and their control of the Bank of Rome, the Bank of England, and the American Federal Reserve System. Protestant Great Britain soon became the Vatican's number one enemy. The Jesuits were responsible for multiple assassination attempts on Queen Elizabeth, for planning an invasion of England by Spain, and for the 1602 gunpowder plot to blow up the English Parliament along with King James I, along with many other acts of murder and mayhem on the continent, which led to their eventual banishment from most of the kingdoms of Europe. Prior to the American Revolution, Roman Catholics were barred from voting or holding public office throughout the British colonies. As was well documented in the book Rulers of Evil by Tupper Saucy, Catholics owed allegiance to Pontifex Maximus, the Bishop of Rome, a foreign ruler who, as a matter of public policy, regarded the British king and his Protestant church as heretics to be destroyed. To allow Catholics to vote or hold office was tantamount to surrendering their colonies to a foreign conqueror. A crucial part of maintaining personal liberty in Protestant colonial America was keeping Roman Catholics out of government. But then came the revolution. The colonial citizenry fought for and won their independence from Great Britain. But they established a constitution that amounted to surrendering their country to a foreign conqueror, the Pope. Before the constitution was ratified, American Catholics had few civil rights. After ratification, they had them all. With Article 4, Section 3 in the First Amendment, the Constitution welcomed agents of Pontifex Maximus, the world's chief enemy of Protestantism, into the ranks of government. That was the supreme goal and great accomplishment of the man who should be seen as America's true founding father, the man that truly engineered the American War for Independence, Lorenzo Ricci, Superior General of the Jesuits from 1758 through 1775. He did this using his network of agents in America and Europe and a multi-pronged plan executed on several fronts, which included first fomenting the French and Indian War on the American continent, and it also included the use of a clandestine Jesuit tutor in the house of King George II of England, namely John Stuart, 3rd Earl of Butte. Butte was appointed Lord of the Bedchamber in the King's house over the King's grandson, George William and soon became George William's surrogate father and beloved mentor. A year later, George William's father, the Prince of Wales, mysteriously died for which the rumor mill blamed Butte, leaving a very young George William as the heir to the throne. When George William became King George III of England in 1760, he was a dysfunctional teenager who fearfully turned the British Empire over to his surrogate father, John Stuart, 3rd Earl of Butte, a Jesuit infiltrator. John Stuart acted swiftly to gain power in Parliament and to pass successive acts of tyrannical taxation against the colonies to turn them against the Crown. Finally, on April 19, 1775, the shot heard round the world was fired, igniting the American War for Independence. One of the greatest victors of that war was Lorenzo Ricci, Superior General of the Jesuit Order. As the Jesuits gained access to American government, over which they later gained complete mastery. Almost a century later, U.S. President Abraham Lincoln had this to say about the Jesuits' fomenting of the Civil War. He said this war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. We owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons. Though there were great differences of opinion between South and North on the question of slavery, neither Jeff Davis nor any one of the leading men of the Confederacy would have dared attack the North had they not relied on the promise of the Jesuits that under the mask of democracy, the money and arms of the Roman Catholics, even the arms of France, were at their disposal if they would attack us. The Protestants of both the North and South would surely unite to exterminate the priests and the Jesuits if they could learn how the priests, the nuns, and the monks, which daily land on our shores, under the pretext of preaching their religion, are nothing else but the emissaries of the Pope, of Napoleon III, and the other despots of Europe, to undermine our institutions, alienate the hearts of our people from our constitution and our laws, destroying our schools, and prepare a reign of anarchy here as they have done in Ireland, in Mexico, in Spain, and wherever there are any people who want to be free. 
Charles Chinicky, an ex-Catholic priest and courageous Christian preacher who had become a close personal friend of Abraham Lincoln, said this of Lincoln's assassination by Jesuit agents. He said, but who was that assassin? Booth was nothing but the tool of the Jesuits. It was Rome who directed his arm after corrupting his heart and damning his soul. And after 20 years of constant and most difficult researches, I am come fearlessly today before the American people to say and prove that the president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated by the priests and the Jesuits of Rome. General Thomas M. Harris, who was a physician and U.S. Army Brigadier General during the Civil War, authored a book titled, Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, wherein he wrote, a foreign political power, meaning Rome by the way, has gotten a lodgment in this land of liberty and is evidently bent on the destruction of our free institutions and substituting for them papal despotism, a despotism that lords it over the minds, the consciences, and the actions of its subjects, and thus renders them incapable of loyalty to any other government. Harris also said this, the organization of the Roman Catholic hierarchy is a complete military despotism of which the Pope is the ostensible head, ostensible meaning the professed or the superficial head. Harris said, the black Pope is the head of the order of the Jesuits and is called a general. He not only has command of his own order, but directs and controls the general policy of the Roman Catholic Church. He is the power behind the throne and is the real potential head of the hierarchy. It would seem that the Jesuits had it in mind from the beginning of the war to find an occasion for the taking off of Mr. Lincoln. The favorite policy of the Jesuits is that of assassination. We would add, by the way, that that same policy was implemented by that same organization almost a century later in the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Since the time of the Civil War, many hundreds of loyal Jesuit agents have occupied top positions in American government. Have you ever wondered why, for the last several decades, it doesn't matter who occupies the White House? American foreign policy never changes. As an example, Barack Hussein Obama lied his way into the White House promising to end Bush's war of aggression in Iraq, only to continue the exact same war policy held by George Bush. Former President Bill Clinton, who touted himself as a Bible-carrying Baptist, was in fact a loyal Jesuit-trained graduate and class president at Jesuit Georgetown University before being inducted as a Rhodes Scholar and attending Oxford and Yale universities as well. Some finally believe Ronald Reagan was a great American president. Well, I can change that in a hurry. But Reagan was just another great actor. There you go again. And a loyal papist. Indeed, your holiness. Who was the first president to give diplomatic recognition to the Vatican, a diabolical act in itself, and was also the first president to take his oath of office on the west side of the Capitol, facing the obelisk of the Washington Monument, as all presidents since then have also done. In the Obama administration alone, 30 appointees to top position are Jesuit University alumni, including former Secretary of Defense and CIA Director Leon Panetta, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates, Secretary of Homeland Security Janet Napolitano, Secretary of State John Kerry, and White House Chief of Staff William Daley, just to name a few. From the CIA's inception in 1947, Almost every director of that organization has been Jesuit-trained Knights of Malta or Vatican puppets, as have many other top officials in U.S. government, including Vice President Joseph Biden, Presidents George Bush I and II, and Gerald Ford. And it was a special moment to be able to visit uh, with the Holy Father in the Oval Office. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. 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 Former Speakers of the House, Newt Gingrich and John Boehner. Current House Speaker Paul Ryan, Henry Kissinger, Colin Powell, Madeleine Albright, along with many other powerful men in network media, big business and banking, including J.P. Morgan, the Rockefellers, the Fords, Tom Brokaw, Walter Cronkite, and the list goes on and on. Do it live! I can all write it and we'll do it live! As stated earlier, since the 1870s, the Jesuit order has exerted almost total control over American and global politics. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an unseen hand that guides the official policies of the United States of America. That's because American political policy, both foreign and domestic, is controlled by that same power that controls the CIA, the FBI, the military, 
and the network broadcast media. And that power is Rome, operating through its Jesuit agents. So to summarize, in Revelation 17, we see this harlotrous woman, an apostate, idolatrous religious system, which is Rome, riding on the beast of a global military empire, a revived Roman Babylonian empire. We now see that that empire is without doubt the American empire that Rome created, financed, and helped her daughter America to build. America is the daughter of Babylon and still takes marching orders from her mother, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 through 27, shows that the Antichrist, who confirms the seven-year covenant with Israel, will be aligned with Rome. As we've shown herein, because the American Empire is the revived Roman Empire, we have good cause to conclude that the Antichrist, the first beast of Revelation 13, will rise to power from a political capital headquartered at Washington, D.C. Our conclusion, then, is that not only can it no longer be said, as the Supreme Court once declared, that America is a Christian nation, but in truth, America has fallen. The secret occult agenda of many of the founders of America and of the unseen hand of the black pope that guided the creation of this nation has finally come to full fruition. As Christians, we are called out of the darkness of this world and are now citizens of the kingdom of heaven. You need to see that America is the offspring and the tool of the Vatican, that America is a vassal tributary in a papal state of the Vatican, and is actually the Vatican's sword being used to build its empire, the new world order. Babylon the Great is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Before we close, we want to remind you that the Lord says to his people in Revelation 18 verse 4, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. We do believe American Christians must separate themselves from Babylon, both spiritually and also politically. It's time that Christians wake up and see that there is no political solution to America's fall. The political process in this nation is totally controlled by the devil and his henchmen operating through Rome's Jesuit order. Christians must regain the faith and perseverance of the early church and apostles, who were persecuted and martyred because they refused to say Caesar is Lord and of whom the Bible says in Acts 17, verse 7, These all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, one Jesus. Christians are to pledge allegiance only to the Lord Jesus, and not to any flag. No man can serve two masters. And by the way, neither can the churches. Hi. Sing that again. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in eternal life. One way we believe Christians must come out of Babylon is by making a mass exodus from the state incorporated churches that refuse to shed their state-approved and state-regulated corporate tax-exempt status, that by their 501c3 contract with the beast have literally become federal franchises of commercial Babylon, and have also by that same contract dethroned the Lord Jesus and made the state the head of their organization. 
This is so because every incorporated church organization is given life as a fictional person in commerce and at law by the ancient Roman entity known as a corporation that is itself and by law a creature of the state and that is therefore by law under the control of the state as has been made clear in multiple U.S. Supreme Court decisions. The corporation is then given a government subsidy called tax exemption when it agrees to abide by the provisions of Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3, which forbids the church from influencing legislation or promoting whatever the IRS and the federal government calls propaganda. Ladies and gentlemen, to subject the church to federal and state law in this manner is an idolatrous betrayal of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to be the sole and exclusive head over his church, and whose law book, the Bible, is to be the only law for the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul describes the position that God the Father gave to God the Son, declaring, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, that in all things he might have the preeminence. However, no state incorporated church can say that the Lord Jesus Christ is head over all things, or has the preeminence in that church. Because in fact and at law, every state incorporated church answers first and foremost to the state. For thorough documentation of this subject, please go to the sermons page on our website at www.independencebaptist.com. Download the PDF and listen to the message titled, Come Out of Her, My People. We do believe true Christians should come out of all government-controlled churches that refuse to renounce this status and to form true New Testament churches under the sole headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beyond that, every Christian should seek God's will as to what he needs to do on a personal level to come out of modern-day Babylon, to be separate from her and to refuse to support her wicked policies and agendas. Not only its wicked policies of abortion and homosexual same-sex marriage, but also its wicked war policy of creating and supplying rogue enemies like Al-Qaeda and ISIS to wage wars of aggression in the Middle East and to dominate that region. It was through this policy that America conquered Iraq and became the actual possessor of ancient Babylon, which is one more reason we say that America the Beautiful has become America the Babylon. America has not only ceased to be good. America is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. God's judgment and great tribulation is coming to America. We believe the Lord Jesus says to his people today, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God's people need to heed that call. Time for the I trust to God.